Okay, now let's talk about demand when the when products have perfect substitutes. Okay, and remember, perfect substitutes they look like uh, this. Utility is some function of these uh, the two goods, and we just add them together with possibly with exponents on it. So the example I'll do will be really simple. I'll set these exponents equal to one, so that the utility is just f plus s. Okay. All right. So what does the indifference curve look like in this case? Well, they're just straight lines with slope equal to 1, okay? If I had done alpha and beta different and equal to something else, then the uh, slope would be some ratio of the two. But right now, the slope is just equal to 1, okay? These are the indifference curves. Okay, and we need to add, to figure out demand, we need to add on to this diagram our uh, budget constraint. And I'm gonna do this with a dashed line because otherwise it's gonna look identical. And it turns out it matters, uh, you know, the slope of this thing does matter, but not quite in the way we're normally used to. Suppose this, is, this dashed line is my uh, budget constraint. Okay, we can see that it crosses three different indifference curves. It crosses down here at the corner, it crosses up here at a corner, and it crosses in the middle. But nowhere is the slope equal to one, okay? If, in this case, we have negative uh, PS over PF, and it's not equal to one, then that means that we're never going to have the uh, price ratio equal to the marginal rate of substitution, okay? And we haven't really dealt with this case yet, but uh, that's because it kind of gives us these weird answers. So if we do draw the diagram, we can clearly see that if your goal is to maximize utility, then you should actually choose this bundle up here. It doesn't have the same slope, but we can see graphically that when the slope is always the same with perfect complements, we're not going to use that criteria anymore okay and as we get into if you go to graduate school you can like formalize these and bring these kinds of conditions into a lagrangian approach but we don't really need it for this course okay so in this case we're going to consume only food okay and what's going on here i should say if negative one uh, in this case this line is really steep okay so it's like closer to negative infinity, and that means it's less than negative one. Alternatively, we could say that like PS divided by PF is greater than one, okay? If we flip everything, multiply everything by negative one, and, or that's the case where PS is greater than PF, okay? And this makes it easy to see. If these goods are identical in terms of how much utility they give us, but food is cheaper than shelter, then never buy shelter, only buy food. And that's what this answer is telling us. So if PF is greater than PS, your demand for food is given by Y divided by PF. You take all your income and you spend it on food, okay? On the other hand, what happens if uh, we have the price of shelter fall so much that the demand curve or the budget curve condition now looks like this. Okay, and this is supposed to intersect down in this corner. In this case, we should be down here consuming only shelter. And that's the opposite case. If PF is, I wrote this backwards, this should be up here. Um, PS is greater than PF, which is what I had written here, okay? So now, now it's all balled up. Oh, let me pause and clean it up. All right, so that's fixed. If PF is less than PS, we only consume food because it's cheaper. If the price of food is greater than the price of shelter, the amount of food we demand is zero. We don't want any. We're going to spend all our money on S. And in fact, S is got that kind of demand curve. And up here, we can see that the demand for S is actually zero. Okay. What happens if they're on the knife edge? where they're just equal to each other, then F is undefined, right? Any value of F that's drawn from the interval zero to Y over P 
PF is equally good, all right? So this is a notation for saying F is somewhere between zero and Y over PF, which just means that you're spending some of your money on F. It could be zero, it could be all of it. It doesn't matter because it's the same as, it gives you the same shelter, the same utility as shelter, and it costs the same as shelter. So you, it's like you don't even distinguish between the two, okay? So what happens if we try to draw this crazy thing? Well, we can see that we get a very strange demand curve. All right, so this is the price of food up here. And let's suppose the price of shelter is this one right here. If the price of food is above the, uh, above the price of shelter, then demand is zero for food. We don't buy any food. Once the price of food is equal to the price of shelter, we can say this is y divided by ps, then any amount on this interval here is equally good. You would demand, we can't even pin it down, but you're going to demand something on that interval. And then as we go there from there, we enter this domain where uh, demand is equal to y divided by pf. Up here, it's just zero. And on here, it's the interval between zero and y over ps, okay? And so you can see that with perfect substitutes, the amount demanded actually does depend on the price of the other good. Because if the price of the other good is low, you just only consume that good. If the price of the other good is high, you only consume the cheap good. And if they're exactly equal, then you get some kind of undefined zone, okay? So demand under perfect substitutes, I feel like this is a nice illustration of, you know, you'd think that utility functions where you just add things together would be the easiest, right? It's just, let's, let's make things simple. Why do we have to make the life hard? And the answer is because like things that seem simple can actually become hard later down the road. The Cobb-Douglas function sort of seems unintuitive, but it ends up having a lot of nice properties for demand, perfect substitutes and perfect complements. Well, perfect substitute seems very simple, like we should start with that assumption and then add some complexity later, but it turns out it just makes life hard uh, when we do demand curves, okay? So let's talk now about the Cobb-Douglas, which is used a lot by economists because it has a lot of nice attractive features.